And this is a, a freestanding tank for processing gold by gravity concentration. And they're all built on the same plan. Obviously, they're different sizes, different heights, but they don't vary very much. And you can see how beautifully this is made inside with all the stones faced. They're uh, sort of cut and faced. And sometimes we can find slight rem uh, remains of some um, plaster. So I don't know whether they've been plastered or not. There's not enough evidence to say that. But there's this upper entrance of the um, flume coming in there. And um, usually directly opposite, which is in this case too, is a drain going out. And they both are constructed in this massive platform. And um, the drain going out is um, quite small. But you, this one is here, we checked. But, um, you know, it's covered with humus and things now. So it needs excavating. And it's used, it's got a little lintel. It's beautifully made. Same as the tunnel. It's got uh, slabs, much smaller slabs. The tunnel is made with big slabs across, and both of them have beautiful lintels on either end. Um, drains are sometimes um, um, destroyed because it's a weak part of the uh, platform construction. And what really happened in here was that, um, if you see this uh, ring here, um, about five grams in weight, and if you had, if you were mining, say, five grams a ton, which is, um, you know, medium kind of uh, um, value, um, not very high, but you would need, to get that out of it, you'd need a ton of ore. So you can imagine there's a lot of waste that has to be got rid of before the old miners who didn't have cyanide, they didn't have mercury um, to get down to the actual gold. So what we were doing in here was reducing the waste um, by gravity concentration. Gold being heavy, it goes down to the bottom and waste was lifted off. And then what they were ended up with was a, a much lighter, um, smaller quantity, which they could take down to the rivers, which is only just down the hill there every case there's always a river near or a stream and then pan it in a normal way. We're now standing at the um, platform outer wall and you can see that it is quite high, built of very, very Last time, but it's roughly built, not not beautifully lined and and built like the inside of the tank. This is really the outside of the platform, and um, it, it actually goes deeper. You can't see where all the grass now, but um, it, it's a um, massive construction. Um, you know, taking it quite a long time to, to actually to build it. But we're going to walk down to where the drain exit comes out, which is this here. Here you can see the beautiful lintel construction of the drain, and there's the drain itself. Um, this is all, um, in mining terms, we'd call them tailings, you know. You can retreat this and find gold. Some, some, that's probably why this is there. It has sometimes like a stone basin collecting this. And I've sampled, oh, 30 of these, also spaced about, across about uh, 65 kilometers. And um, this one is a particularly high one. It's 1.78 grams a ton in this particular one of gold, yes. Uh, which is residue, high residue, of something much higher that they were treating in the tank.
the uphill entrance of the tank, the tunnel that goes into the tank, which you'll see in a minute. But this is where the water fed in. And as you can see, there's a steep slope. And then this tunnel actually will curve and then feed into the tank. It's not a passage for cattle, as uh, has been thought of for now 60 years. It's impossible to get animals in there. And it's actually a flume, in mining terms, a flume for feeding water into the tank. This is the exit of the um, tunnel, which is really a flume for water, and um, into the tank. And a mining engineer in um, southern Zimbabwe has pointed out that if they were using a, a gravity concentration method, a processing method for gold, there's one method called hindered settling. And for that, you need the water to come in at the bottom of the tank to start the process. Because what you're doing is like a jig, um, mining terms a jig, you're um, churning up the ore and, and residue stuff in there and um, trying to separate out the high grade from the low grade. And you do it for the water and go having very high um, specific gravity, the highest of metals, it will fall down to the bottom. On page 35 of this um, booklet on my research, and it's recommended by National Museums, called Gold Mining Landscapes of Inyanga, Discovering Zimbabwe's Hidden Heritage. And here are some results which prove the direct evidence of gold having a connection, with the processing of gold in those tanks. These are results out of um, 30 others, this is 13 of them, um, from tunnels and drains. So samples were taken from tunnels and drains, and that is invariably, again, crushed quartz. And here you have the results going from 0 0.04 up to 1.78, which is the um, drain exit uh, you saw on the film. And they were tested in a laboratory by fire assay which is a mining um, test for, if you're prospecting, you take grab samples from hill slopes and you send samples to be tested and then it comes up with the um, value of gold in that sample. So it gives you results like, uh, I don't know, four grams a ton, 6.4 or something like that. And you'll know which areas are, have um, gold in the ore bodies and are worth um, mining. These terraces on this hill are typical in Zimbabwe or in Yanga. You don't get terraces in Zimbabwe anywhere but in the Eastern Highlands, and it's particularly here in Yanga. And the, the style of these terraces is um, it runs up the east coast of Africa from actually even lower, the southern part of um, um, Zimbabwe, running into the Mpulanga, um Barberton Gold Belt in South Africa, from there all the way up to Jordan. And when you compare where the terraces lie on the hills where they've been built with the geological maps of those countries, you find that the formations, the geological formations, are um, mainly Precambrian. And um, that is the best known formation for um, gold, uh, hosting gold. And it's the formation that any um, um, exp exploration companies and so on coming to Africa go first to, to those areas. And, but the terraces indicate that the place of mining, the rich surface um, uh, secondary enrichment, has been mined out. And one wonders, now, who are these miners who've done this? On our day, 1080 is going to be... Um, reduced backwards is going to be earlier because the tank that the date was found in, that little piece of um, um, hard-baked clay, um, will be older. So one has to wonder about um, Ophir. 
and King Solomon's mind, David, and um, if you work out the num vast number of talents of gold that Solomon took out uh, every three years, and that David had already um, safeguarded for the building of the, te te um, the temple, and that was about 3,000. So you, you then work it out, say at five grams a ton, which is low really for mining, and the, um, the amount of ore that has to be mined for that goes into millions of tons. So a vast amount of upheaval should be seen in this part of East Africa if Ophir really existed. But if we take the, uh, the uh, Bible history as hard evidence, um, then where did they go? Because they went um, seafaring for every three years. Um, they would mine somewhere and go back home with the gold. Um, and if you work it out where these uh, mines could possibly be, knowing that you've got uh, gold hosting formations near the coast on these hills, terraced hills, um, then it, it, it looks like Kenya. Um, but there's another possibility for Adjisimba, and that was a Roman general who found Abyssinia, uh, not Abyssinia, I'm sorry, Adjisimba, and um, he uh, went for 360 something um, miles, and Roman miles are very similar in addition to um, English miles. And when you work that out, and also the latitude, they were quite accurate in latitude in those days, it lands up in Zimbabwe, parallel with the Nyanga Hills. Um, and then um, there's a building in Buruel which has a facade saying 3,600 miles to from um, Buluwayo to Cairo, which is about the distance he did. But Ptolemy, the um, um, much better known geographer than um, Marinus, his predecessor, who came up with these figures, reduced the area to by 20%. Uh, but you go with, um, with Marinus' um, table, and he was writing this at almost exactly the same years that Marinus uh, that Maternus, they all have similar names, <laughs> um, General Maternus did this incredible march down um, in Africa. Um, then it comes to a land with mountains, rhinos, and elephants. So that looks like Zimbabwe. Um, and this is the, this one up the Great Rift Valley? Yes. And that's by chance with the formations again. Those, those um, Precambrian belts. They run up all the way down. The, I don't know why, but that's what they do. So um, Precambrian belts are the most sought after gold hosting formations, geological formations in the world. And they run from the Barbican gold belt in South Africa through Zimbabwe. Not Nyanga, it has a different formation, but the, the, um, the plateau where there were Old mines are dated for about 700 AD uh, by the Arabs. They wrote a lot about the gold mining of Safala, and those were the gold mines on Zimbabwe's well-known greenstone belts, which are also um, coveted by uh, exploration companies, large exploration companies. So to get the um, quartz grains in there, it starts off like pieces of quartz like this, which um, they mine by uh, placer mining, which is surface mining, um, secondary enrichment, it's usually quite rich. These look very interesting to me as an ex one time prospector gold miner in Matabili land, which <coughs> is south of the country. And um, because a lot of quartz reefs are white, and we, they're known as buckreef. They, they've just uh, got no values of gold. So what they did was crush these on a grindstone. There's no sample here because the people take them away for their bird bars in places like Harare, and the evidence was gone. But um, to get um, 
it to the final process, quotes has to be crushed, washed in a tank, and then pulverized um, really, really, really fine, as fine as possible. Now, this could happen to help that by a burning process, because a burning process with quartz in, increases the friability and makes it easier to, to pulverize. Um, it also could be used as um, a method of burning of sulfur, which is contaminating, but I don't think this part of Zimbabwe would have that problem. Um, so Pliny, in the second century AD, has the process beautifully written in his treatise on um, mines in early Spain, Las Medulas, and he calls it, um, once they have dug out the ore, they crush it and wash it and burn it and reduce it to powder. So he's got the whole process in there for um, pre-mechanical mining. This is a rather um, um, destroyed example of an oven. There's a better one I can show you. But um, it's, it's quite interesting because every single one, there's one over there, has that um, matrix, that sort of reddish kind of matrix on top. And it seems what they were doing was by natural draft, quite different from the um, iron smelting, they were roasting that to either get rid of um, sulfides, we don't have much sulfide problem in this part of Zimbabwe, or the other thing is to make coarse more friable for crushing. So I'll show you a better one, you can get a better idea, but on this next one here, you see there's a flume, I'm sorry, a, a flue in a hole in, in the middle of the top of the oven. I've had um, 11 of these tested, all very widely spaced apart, and every single one has residue of gold in this matrix. The matrix is made of quartz, very finely crushed quartz grains, and uh, little pieces of charcoal. So I'll be able to show you a better one just around the corner on the same platform. This platform has about five interesting dates. Um, from something connected with one of these ovens, but the oven was found inside a tank with two of them together. And it was a complete chance that I um, discovered them as ovens. This particular tank is not about a one and a half case from here. And um, it was completely covered with uh, trees and bush and everything else. And I always th thought of it as the boring tank. And one morning, I, I, two mornings, I got this sort of feeling that I must go up to the tank, that boring one. So finally I did. And there'd been a bushfire that had cleared all the overgrowth completely off. And what I saw, you can imagine the tank, were two slight mounds in the middle at the bottom. And I saw projecting from one mound one of those um, distinctive stones, with, with, uh, the curved stone. So I thought, that is an oven. So then we decided um, we would do a rescue uh, excavation there very quickly and um, to see how these ovens are actually made. So we went down and as we got further towards the back of one of the ovens, uh, 54 centimeters down, uh, I found a little piece of um, hard-baked clay which is ideal for um, luminescence dating, thermal luminescence dating, because it hadn't seen the light of day since it was dropped in there. So with um, permits from National Museums, uh, um, sent it by DHL across to uh, Washington State University in the United States, and they came up with a date of 1080 AD to plus, you know, plus or minus up to um, 1180 AD. And that is uh, a thousand years ago, much late, earlier than many dates have been found in the whole of Zimbabwe, for this, especially for these things. So that was an exciting discovery. 
uh, inside these particular tanks and we got a much better idea of how these things are, 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 are constructed. All this construction is um, superb. It's, it's um, skillful engineering in stone and the whole system of tank is hydraulic engineering. It's unsurpassed. just found another oven and it's completely here there is the uh, special stone over the main draft hole and there is the matrix that really brown color with the moss going on top here's the sample again the same thing quartz grains little bits of charcoal here's one and the stick impression in there. So that was the twigs all uh, set alight. And the ones that didn't burn out completely have formed the charcoal. Beautiful bits of tiny quartz in there. So um, here you can see how it's constructed. Um, there is one of the plinths. Um, stones about this height. And they are covered by the soils, firmly embedded. Uh, about three quarters of the way. You can see the little bit sticking up here. And they're placed all around. And these big enormous slabs go across. So there's air coming through the, the, the um, distance between the slabs, coming through the, uh, the draft holes. Um, and sometimes, as the other one has, um, there's a flue in the middle. So that's how it works. And um, it, we... Again, we just got to get funding to um, to pursue this to find out exactly from metallurgists what the process was. From here you can see the, the name pit structure given to these structures for about nearly a hundred years now is complete misnomer. Um, the tank is not a pit, it's a freestanding tank, freestanding in this great big platform built up from ground level, it goes further down the hill slope, and the whole thing is on a slope from the entrance tunnel, which is the flume, into the tank on slope and the drain coming out also on slope. This was just um, the radial arms, sometimes only one but two, and they widely spaced, um, directing water runoff into the tank. Um, it wouldn't have like two separate walls here. That is clearly a water channel. You can actually see them up from as high as this. That is one wall, and that is the other wall of a water channel. And when it was, uh, you know, it's all silted up now through the centuries, but when it was running, it would have run down and directed straight into the upper entrance, which you're going to see in a minute, down at the bottom.